I'm looking at the clock back there, and I, I don't know what the weather is like outside, but I imagine it's not raining right now. Or is it stop Ruth? Story. Story. I'm going to try to shorten my sermon. Now, when I say this, Steve says, oh, no. It's all winners in that. But I, I kind of wish many of you would have had the opportunity of knowing my wife. She was a very special person. In fact, she kept me on the straight and narrow. And she still does because when I feel her presence in almost everything I do. But I can remember back at Kentucky Christian College, back in 1950, 51, when I first met her. She was a charming young lady. I, uh, I happened to meet her when she came on campus, and we got talking then, and we were friends from that time on. But my wife had a habit of wearing her fingernails long and sharp. She would foul them down to the point that if she touched you with them, you knew you were touched. You know, you know the type of person I'm talking about, I'm sure. She kept them long for the first several years that we were married until Steve was born. And for some reason, changing diapers and taking care of a child, she cut them back so that they would not hurt the baby as she was working with, with Steve. But she was also claustrophobic. The 4th of July before we were married, she came up to meet my family. And uh, we, we had a time. Dad wanted to take us to his favorite restaurant, which was located on the Pennsylvania Turnpike. I don't know how many of you ever drove the Pennsylvania Turnpike or wherever on there, but they have these long tunnels, which they call tubes. Some of them were two, three mile long, and when you entered them, you didn't see the end of the tunnel because it was the length of the tunnel. We would be sitting in the back seat, and as we were sitting in the back seat, when we entered the tunnel, she would grab my arm and dig those nails into the, my flesh. You know the feeling, I'm sure. She tensed up to the point, and she kept looking out the windshield as my dad drove and my mother was sitting in the front seat, until she saw that pinpoint of light which indicated the end of the tunnel. And when she saw that pinpoint of light, the fingers eased up a little bit. And the bigger that light came, the closer we got to the end of the tunnel. She would let up even more. And finally, when she went and exited the tunnel, she would relax and breathe a sigh of relief. And to be one honest with you, I did too. Because my arm at times, she even <laughs> dug her finger down on my arm one time that she broke the flesh and I was bleeding. That's how sharp our nails were. But I could not help but think of that. Pinpoint of light. And the hope that would help a claustrophobic person like my wife understand that there's hope that that tunnel is going to come to an end. That's a couple of Sundays ago, we talked about the Beatitudes, and I happened to prepare this sermon for last Sunday morning. But after Jesus gave the Beatitudes in the fifth chapter of the book of, uh, of uh, Matthew, he spoke about a hope. And I'm going to read that to you, Matthew, the fifth chapter, verses 13 through 16. You are the son of the earth. If the salt hath lost its savior, wherewith shall we be salt? It is thenceforth not good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of man. Ye are the light of the world, the city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a basket, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now, I want you to look at that 16th verse. 
Let your light so shine before man. Why? So that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is never. All the good that we do on earth is not done for our benefit, for our glory. It's done for the glory of Jesus Christ. In a sense, being the salt of the earth, being a light that is set on a hill, is an emphasis that is given to us that we might be able to glorify God and be a hope, a pinpoint of light in this dark world. Curiosity is killing me right now. I, I wonder how many of you have ever gone through a cave, a cavern, and at some point the God that is leading you through that cave will stop, turn out the lights and tell you to put your hand in front of your face and you cannot even see your hand when it's stuck right in front of your face. I, I, I've even put it all the way to my nose and touched my nose to see if I can see my hand. You cannot do it. But if you turn the light on, I had one guy who came down in Sweetwater, Tennessee called the Lost Sea. He had a pocket flashlight, very dim, turn it on. In that cave, that little pinpoint of light was able to be visual almost throughout all the group that was going. Interesting. We are commanded or ordered by Jesus Christ to be the salt of the earth that the earth might be seasoned. To be the light in the world. That we might lead others to Jesus Christ. That they might glorify God through the things that we do. And I think we need to realize that there is an emphasis. And what is the best way? What is the best way that we can, as Christian people, shine forth our light? Season the earth with our salt. I think one word. Love. Now remember, I prepared this sermon for last week. I think we need to realize that as Christian people, our love is going to be the greatest emphasis, the greatest work that we can do on earth. In Luke's 10th chapter, we find that Jesus is asked the question, what is the greatest commandment of all? I think we all can answer that. And the answer is said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. Understand, love God. If we love God, what will we be doing? First of all, we will do His will. We will pray, we will study His Word, we will endure to the end, we will witness to others. But I want to stress something else. We will attend church. When I was growing up, and in my years of I married the former life, or previous existence, whatever it may be, not, I'm still in the same life. It's coming out different than I wanted to. Whenever I was sick on a weekday, I would always ask myself a question. Would I go to church feeling this bad? And if I would, I would go to work. My primary purpose in life was to go to church. Hebrews, the 10th chapter, the 25th verse, which is not in your notes. Tells the people that were receiving this letter, forsake not the assembly of yourselves together, as a matter of some is. But exhorting one another so much the more, as you see the day approaching. I think for every Christian, everyone who loves the Lord, it's important that they be in church, not to hear the preaching, as much as to be around the Lord's table. To remember Jesus Christ.
Not only do we love God, but we need to love our enemies. One of the passages of Scripture that uh, I read, and uh, I, I wish this could be uh, possible for every one of us, but I say to you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and the, on the unjust. For if you love them which love you, what reward have you? But do he, so do even the publicans the same. But if you salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do even the publicans so? But be ye perfect. Notice that word. Be ye perfect. Be ye mature, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Remember, God loved us and sent Jesus to die for our sins while we were yet sinners even before we were born. We need to love one another, fellow Christians. A new commandment I give unto you that you love one another as I have loved you. Jesus gave his life for us. That you also love one another by this, Jesus said. These are the words of Jesus, not Bill Faust. By this, Jesus said, that the world, that all men shall know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. I get so tired of get Christians gossiping about one another. I get it all the time. Not here necessarily here, but almost everywhere we go. I think everything I've said and everything I want to say is actually summed up in Colossians, the third chapter, verses 1 through 17. By the way, this happens to be one of my favorites. If you know me, you'll hear it over and over and over again. But in Colossians, the third chapter, beginning with the first verse. If you then be risen with Christ, and that's baptism. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. By the way, that's loving God. With all our hearts, with all our minds, with all our soul, with all our strength. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affections, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is adultery. Man, our world needs to do that today. Boy, I, I get so tired of listening to some of these politicians running for president and hearing what they have to say about one another. I think we all need to be careful. He says, For which things say the wrath of God come upon the children of disobedience? In the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. But now ye also put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth, lying not unto another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, nor be gone nor free. For Christ is all in and all. Listen to that. You don't treat people with anger or malice. You don't treat people, especially your brothers and sisters in Christ, in a negative way. And put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, vows of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man hath a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so do also ye. And above all these things, put on love or charity, which is the bond of perfection, perfectness. 
Let the peace of God rule in your hearts, and to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. <coughs> By the way, let's stop right there just for a moment. Psalms is the Greek word for a hymn that is sung with a musical instrument. Hymn is a song, a hymn that is sung without a musical instrument. They mean basically the same, except for one has the music accompaniment. The, the piano, the organ, whatever it may be. In spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of Jesus, the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Wow, what a passage. Here is a little song that we teach our kids. I, I, I thought for a moment I was going to have you sing it, but I'm not going to do that now. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. I, I, I do remember my wife standing before a vacation Bible school, the very first church that we served. Yeah, and that was the first time I ever heard the song. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. I'm not going to sing anymore. Praise God. But I want you to look at that last verse we have in our notes. I'm going to change one section of that. All around Huntington, I'm going to let it shine. All around Huntington, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. You are the light of the world. You are light bulb. You are the salt of the earth. You're a salt chain. And the influence that you have can lead others to Christ. And let us use that influence for His glory. That He might be imminent. One of the things that I remember, my wife and I preached in a small town called Greenford, Ohio. I don't know whether Gail, who lived up in that same area, remembers Greenford or not. Yeah, but we'll tell you later. But she lived up in Borman, which was pretty close to Greenford. But when I went to that church, they put us in the parsonage. And one of the things that, Steve was born there, by the way. And one of the things my wife said, I says, I dare not drop Steve on the floor because he'll roll down to the other end of the floor. That's how level the floors were. There was a neighbor of ours that we visited and kept trying to get to come to church. And I can remember saying, she had a fire in her house, and we went down to help her clean it up. And I can remember her making a comment to me that she realizes what Christ was like because of the way we treat our neighbors. There was a testimony. People will know what Christ is like of a life that you live. We're going to be singing our song of realization. Softly and tenderly, if my memory is the one verse, that's standard. If you need to make a decision for Christ, we ask that you come as we sing.